All right, if you have your Bibles today and you would join me, please. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 through verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 through verse 20. Just six verses. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, In the Life. In the Life. Amen. Galatians chapter 2, 15 through 20. And the word of God today reads from the King James text in this fashion. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. I want to talk to us today for a while on the topic, In the Life. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, once again, God, we come before you as the Word of God is opened and as the preaching is about to begin. Lord, for many it would seem an empty and useless exercise. Many say, well, we've already prayed. Why must we pray now at this point in the service? And the reason we pray, oh God, is because the preaching of the gospel is so important. It is so powerful. It is able to accomplish so very much when it is done with the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost upon it and behind it. But Lord, a man's words, a woman's words, without the anointing, the presence, the power of the Holy Ghost, are empty and useless and accomplish little, if anything, and therefore, O oh God, before the word is preached, we always come to you. We always implore you. We ask you, O oh God, that by your spirit you would go forth and touch hearts and minds as they hear the word of the Lord. Help the hearer to understand that this is indeed today, O oh God, a message from heaven sent with love through the minister of the gospel and touch this preacher today, O oh God, that I might speak that which you would have me to speak and that I might remain silent where you would have me to remain silent. Help me, Lord, to deliver this word for it's an important word for the church today. We ask it all in that precious name, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Amen. Praise God and Amen. You know, when 
folks possess enormous wealth and great prosperity and they may be own companies and corporations and they're able to leave the majority of their work to their employees. They're able to leave the majority of their work to managers and supervisors. And they're able then to enjoy their wealth and they're able to go out and play golf and they're able to go yachting and they're able to do the things that wealthy people do. We often say that those people have a life of leisure, don't we? Say, boy, he just lives a life of leisure. When people retire after many years in the public sector, working secular jobs, when folks retire and they're no longer having to get up at the crack of light and they're no longer having to respond to an alarm clock and rush to the shower and get dressed and shave and make their way to the office. Uh, when folks retire and they no longer are involved in the hustle and bustle of everyday work life, we often say they too are in a life of leisure. Sometimes we'll say, boy, they've got a dog's life. A dog's life is a simple life. They eat, they sleep, they poo. That's it. Amen. And many people think, boy, there's, there's no better life in this world than a dog's life. Amen. All you got to worry about is eating, sleeping, and visiting the restroom. That's it. I don't have, a, a, I don't have another care in the world. It used to be, many years ago, things have changed amazingly enough. It used to be, and I'm not criticizing and I'm not condemning, so please do not interpret what I'm about to say. But it used to be that if a couple chose to live together outside of the bonds of holy matrimony, as it is often called, that they would be referred to as living in sin. You remember that? Back in the day, oh my, if you if you were living together, my heavens, and you weren't married. I remember my grandmother were talking about one of her daughters, my aunt, saying, oh yes, so-and-so is living in sin, bless God. You know, it didn't matter where your faith was at. It didn't matter what you believed or how you believed. It didn't matter if you went to church or didn't go to church. All, all that mattered was you were living with a man, you were living with a woman, and you didn't have a ring on your finger and a, a certificate on the wall, and that meant you were living in sin. There are all kinds of conditions, all kinds of situations in the life of human beings that we categorize as living a certain life. Amen. Living a dog's life, or we're, they're, they're living a life of leisure, or they're living in sin. Do you know what I'm talking about? In 1989, I went through one of the most horrific, humiliating, embarrassing situations and circumstances that I've ever endured in my entire life, and I can honestly say even to this day, I've never experienced anything quite as horrific as what I went through. And through a series of circumstances well beyond my control, some Christian folks that I was staying with at the time, briefly as I was trying to transition into a new city, found some printed material that I had very carefully tucked away in my work bag, a bag that I carried to and from a car dealership that I worked at. And that bag had flyers in it and materials about cars that we sold because as a car salesman, I'll tell you what, uh, I was a salesman 24-7. If I ran into somebody at church and they said, oh, you know, I was thinking about shopping for a new car and, you know, uh, I was interested maybe in getting one of those Ford uh, Tauruses or one of those, you know, Ford uh, Tempos or whatever. Y'all can tell how long ago this was now. 
I'd be able to say, well, now you hold on a minute, and then I'd run out to the car, and I'd go to my trunk, and I'd pull out one of them flyers for that model, and of course, stapled to that flyer was my business card, because if you're going to buy a car, I want you to come buy it from me, right? And I figure if I'm the one that gives you the flyer and I start talking to you about it, I can get you to come into the dealership and buy your car from me. Well, I was at a very low point in my life. As a young person, I was lonelier than you could ever begin to imagine. I used to go through horrible, horrible bouts of depression at times. I know what it is to be suicidal. I know what it is to feel like your life is worthless and you are just beyond hope and help. And I have literally felt so low at times and felt so deep in darkness that I felt like a, a young boy trapped in a thousand foot deep waterless well and there was no one nearby that could offer a hand no one that could throw me a rope no one that could lower a ladder and I'd look up and the light was so far above my head Tommy that I just never thought I'd, I'd ever get out I had struggles going on inside of me it was not lust People that want to believe the stupidity that homosexuality and being gay is about lust. That is the most idiotic and stupid notion any human being could ever latch on to. Are there people who are so full of lust and so overcome by lust that, you know, they'd be willing to uh, copulate with a stuffed animal? Sure, there are people like that. There are people like that in the heterosexual community. There are people like that in the gay community. That is by no means a, a gay invention, nor is it something owned by the gay community. But to hear certain preachers tell it, you know, uh, homosexuals invented lust and invented uh, wanton sexual appetites, you know. And it's interesting because I can go to any number of websites online and I can find all kinds of videos and photographs that appeal to all kinds of grotesque and whacked out sickening sexual appetites and guess what not a one of the sites will be gay watch Law and Order Special Victims Unit once in a while see what some of the unusual and strange and perverse appetites there are out there in our world today. But it wasn't lust I was wrestling with, but, but I knew something in me was different. I knew something about the way I thought was not the way the average person thought. I knew that I was attracted to people again, not sexually, just you know, when you're a, a little girl, Tracy, or you're a little fella, Don, and you get a crush on a young lady or on a young fella, you know, and your heart kind of flutters, and you're just a kid. You're not thinking in terms of sexuality. You're not thinking in terms of intimacy. But there's something about that boy. There's something about that girl that just kind of makes your heart beat a little faster and kind of kind of excites you a little bit and and boy you just love to be around them you just love you know there's something that attracts you to them well that happened to me but it sometimes and by the way gay people are not attracted to every stinking thing that uh, shares their gender that notion again is idiotic and stupid and foolish but there are certain attributes in people, there are certain traits that just like anybody else that we find attractive and you know that you're attracted to. There are other traits that you find offensive and vulgar and ugly and, and they turn you off. Well, I had a lot of struggles going on and those struggles, I, I couldn't talk about them with anybody because the church 
made it so abundantly clear that this was perverse and evil and wicked. And in many instances, preachers would identify it as a demon. Oh dear God, I can't, I can't admit to wrestling with this because next thing you know, they're going to be pinning me to the floor trying to cast the demon out of me. You'd be terrified to talk about it. You, there was no one, no one you could talk to. Nobody. You've never felt so alone and so scared and so lonely in your life as when you've gone through that struggle. Well, I went through that struggle my entire youth, my entire growing up. In my early years of ministry, I was a single man, and I was trying so hard to find a girl that would marry me because I thought if I got married, that would fix everything. My problem was something was mixed up in my head, and something wasn't wired quite right, and I actually had preachers. The pastor I served my internship under, I believe he knew my situation. Might have been, I don't know, because there was one young man in our church who was absolutely stunning, absolutely beautiful kid. And he was so sweet. He had such a nice personality and the way he carried himself and all this. And he played piano uh, for the church. And man, this kid could play piano like you wouldn't believe, you know. And boy, I mean to tell you, I just, I just thought he was the cat's meow. And I thought, you know, that I, I kept my internal issues pretty well buried and pretty well covered but this kid had come along and and I'd maybe be talking to the pastor and this young man he was about my age you know he'd come along and all of a sudden I'm going <laughs> some of their church folks make fun of me because one time we went out to eat after, uh, for fellowship and a young man come over and was talking to us and he was I thought he was strikingly handsome. Tommy, of course, thought he was a beast. But uh, we won't go there. <laughs> I thought he was adorable, you know. And I, for some reason, I just started tripping over my words and started, you know, s slurring and stuttering. That happens sometimes. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. That happens when a really beautiful woman comes along, too, for me. You know, because it's not about lust. It's not about anything like that. It's just... I, I'm just so taken by them, you know, that I find myself going, dang, yeah, but that, 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 that. <laughs> So this would happen to me when this kid would come in. And I'm sure that the pastor I did my internship in the Church of God, I'm sure he probably noticed this once or twice. And he used to insist that I get married. He, oh, he was adamant that I get married. And that, you know, somehow that was going to fix everything. Well, in 1989, somewhere around April of 1989, my friends that I was staying with found a publication that I bought. Now, I want to make it clear, it was not pornography, but it was a gay publication that I had picked up at a local book, uh, adult bookstore. I was going through a period, a young lady had rejected me yet again. My mother could tell you, I've, I've had more experience with girls rejecting me than most people could ever dream of. I don't know if they could see the gay in me before I could, you know, I thought I was hiding it pretty well, but they didn't. Uh, of course, Chris Lee found a wife, but we're not going to go there. I don't know how that ever happened. But girls and I just, you know, they were never, just never quite fully interested in me. And I was interested in this one girl I was trying so hard. And once again, she decided I wasn't for her and blah, blah, blah. Long story short, I, I wound up out of pocket for a few days. And these people I was staying with decided they were going to go through my personal belongings. When they did, they found this. Uh, what amounted to a personal publication. Back then, uh, we didn't have the internet like we do today. And so they found this publication, and I'm going to tell you, that publication scared the life out of me. I got it, 
and I looked through it, I was so lonely, I, I was actually contemplating acting upon my internal feelings. I had never done so before this, but I was actually contemplating it. But it scared me so bad, I was so terrified by the whole thought of everything, that I could not get myself to, to step over that line. I knew once I stepped over that line that there might not be any coming back. I finally made up my mind. I said, oh God, when I get home tonight, oh my God, Jesus, I'm, I'm, tomorrow when I go to work, I'm going to take that magazine and I'm going to throw it in the dumpster at work because I knew better, obviously, than throwing it in these people's garbage, you know. I said, I'm going to take it to work and I'm going to throw it away. Oh, Jesus, forgive me. And anybody that's been in church, anybody that's had this struggle, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We've all been there. You're tempted but then you decide, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And you find yourself going to the altar, weeping and wailing and snotting all over the place. And begging God to have mercy on your soul. And begging God to forgive you for being so evil and so wicked. And, blah, 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 blah. and that's where I was at. But that very night, these people had gone through my things and they found this publication... And the man I was staying with was a Pentecostal preacher, mind you. He was not pastoring at the moment, but he was a Pentecostal preacher. And long story short, he came to me with my belongings and said, you're not welcome in my home, I don't want you near my family, I want you out, I don't care where you go, I don't care what you do. But uh, you're no longer welcome in my home. You're an effing animal. You're an effing pig. You're an effing child molester. Literally, people. Literally. This is how he talked. I had never even acted on the stuff. Well, long story short, after, too late. After that experience, folks, I decided... Lord, I'm tired. I, my whole life I've been trying to do the right thing. I still was trying to do the right thing, but this come out before I had a chance to, you know, cover my tracks. And I said, Jesus, I'm tired. I can't do this anymore. I, I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I'm so stinking lonely I can't stand it. I'm not even really attracted to the girls that I'm trying to to get with, as it were, uh, so much as I, I just feel like, you know, having a good, I mean, I was attracted to certain attributes in the girl, you know, but I didn't really care much what she looked like or anything, because all I wanted was a good wife, you know, I was looking at it in terms of a good wife, I, it, it didn't matter to me what she looked like, you know, and I said, Lord, I can't do this anymore, and shortly thereafter, the weekend of Mother's Day, 1989, I traveled by Greyhound bus from Texas back to Connecticut, where I'm from originally. And on that bus trip, I told the Lord, I said, I'm just going to, quote unquote, come out. And I'm just going to live my reality. I can't do this anymore. If I'm going to get ridiculed and chewed up and spit out, if I'm going to be treated the way I was treated, and believe me, there were a whole lot of other people that wound up getting involved in this party too, including the pastor that I was under at the moment. And uh, I said, you know, if I'm going to go through all this when I hadn't even acted on it, then I'm tired. I, I'm sick of being by myself. I'm sick of trying to find a wife. I'm sick of trying to fix myself. And I'm just going to live my reality. So I arrived back in Connecticut on Saturday before Mother's Day, 1989, Mother's Day being Sunday. And that next day, uh, I went for the first time to a club. Now, mind you, I grew up in church. I never had been to a nightclub in my life, straight, gay, or otherwise. I'd never been to a bar in my life, straight, gay, or otherwise. I never had drunk a drink. I have never had done any kind of drug. I never had had any kind of sexual experience or relationship, you know. So, I mean, I was just 
coming out of the church and I knew God hated me. I knew God wanted nothing to do with me. And I knew I was vile and disgusting in His sight. At least this is what I was taught to believe. And I went to a club in New Haven, Connecticut. It's not there any longer. I looked it up somehow. I forget how I found it, but I looked it up to find out where they were. I had no, no clue where such places were. And as I'm going into that club, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, you can help the people in this building to know that my grace is sufficient for them that I understand you and I accept you for who you are. You're, there's nothing about you I don't get. There's nothing about you I don't understand. And I stopped and I said, Lord, what in the world are you talking about? And I've never heard any preacher preach this. I've never heard any pastor say these words. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord speaking to my heart and telling me, I can minister to these people. I said, Lord, what are you at your mind? What am I hearing? He said, Charles, you understand their struggle because you've lived their struggle. This is before I've ever walked into the place, mind you. I said, Lord, I can't help them because I don't even believe half of what you just said. Well, I went into that club and that began for me what many refer to as the process of coming out. I became very active sexually. Guess what? The fellas didn't have near as big a problem with me as the girls did. Of course, I found out in short order that there's a lot of people, especially if you're going to go fishing in nightclubs and bars. Honey, if you think fishing in a nightclub and a bar is going to catch you a, a quality fish that's going to spend their life with you and be devoted to you, I got news for you. The chances of that happening are slim. That's not a good place to be looking for commitment and you know and when I came out in 89 there were so many people who still were struggling and living in the closet for any number of reasons they were living a secret identity so there was a lot of one night stands there was a lot of hit and misses it took me years to finally understand that Tommy a lot of those men they, they weren't they weren't the way they were by choice. They didn't engage in one night stands and, you know, by choice. They would have loved to have had a life partner. They would have loved to have had somebody they could really devote their life to and commit to. But their family circumstance, their work circumstance, their religious circumstance prevented them from even thinking about pursuing that. The, the only thing they could allow themselves to do was go out once in a while and mess around and then go right back into the closet. It took me years to understand that. You know, a lot of what you hear stereotypically of LGBT people, a lot of it, folks, is imposed upon them. It is not a matter of choice. A lot of you young people today who get upset at... Uh, one night stands and people using you as, and it feels like you're being used and thrown away. A lot of you need to understand that in many instances, I'm not saying all, there are sluts and there are whores, God forgive me for such language, in the straight world and there's the same thing in the gay world. It, it's no different. It's absolutely no different. I guarantee you, I've learned this. It took me a long time. But a lot of what LGBT people go through and what they experience, they don't understand. It's the byproduct of the condition of the times. It's the byproduct of circumstance. It's the byproduct of family relationships and of work commitments. There are people I knew who were involved in certain professions, and in that profession, you didn't dare identify as gay. You didn't dare. Or else you'd lose your job and, you know, you were up a creek without a paddle. 
You have those with religious issues. You've got those whose families are very religious. So a lot of what was going on was related to circumstances and situations that were imposed upon people. It wasn't always by choice. But I began to, you know, live, quote unquote, the life. I entered into a whole brand new world. It was nothing I'd ever been in before. It was nothing I was familiar with. Everything was new. Everything was different. There were a lot of things I didn't like. <laughs> there were some things I was kind of keen on, but there was a lot of things I didn't like about it. I began to meet a lot of people, and eventually I moved to New York City, and I began to, to meet a whole lot more people. And all of a sudden, I, I began to meet couples same gender couples who had been together for 30, 40 years. And we'd be talking and all this self-hatred and all this self-loathing would come out of me because it's bred into you. You can't be gay and be happy with yourself. You've got to hate yourself because you're evil, you're wicked, you're filthy, you're dirty, you're a pervert, you're a child molester, all these idiotic notions. But I'm going to tell you something. You tell your kids that garbage and whether they're straight or gay they're going to grow up believing it folks and then when you wind up with a gay child you're going to have a gay child who commits suicide at 16 because they so despise and hate themselves and there isn't a thing in the world they can do about what they feel there is not a thing in the world they can do about what's going on inside of them and you're building loathing and hatred into them that is going to backfire on you because it'll turn around and it will implode upon that child and destroy that child's life. If they don't commit suicide, then like so many others, they'll wind up in a lifestyle of drugs and alcohol and all kinds of promiscuity and sexual perversion. I found out when I came out in 1989, I know I've taken a long time setting this message up today, but I, when I come out in 89, I would, I would say things, you know, like I'd meet a couple of men again 30 years or so, and, and I'd say, yeah, but y'all are the exception, because all gay men are interested in is one night stands, blah, blah, blah. And it, I remember, oh, I remember to this day vividly several of the people I met, and they would shake their head and say, oh, man, I hate hearing you young gay men say such things. I hate hearing young people say such things because you don't know what you're talking about. We have friends who have been together 25 years. We have friends who have been together 30 years. We have friends who have been together 40 years. Uh, we don't go to the clubs. We don't go to the bars. We don't even go to gay pride parades. You know, we don't drink. We don't smoke. We don't do drugs. We go to church. We're committed to each other. We love each other. We live a monogamous life. And I was utterly convinced because of the indoctrination I went through growing up. I was utterly convinced that they were the exception to the rule. That this was not even remotely common in the LGBT community. But I got corrected. I'm going to tell you, some of them flat out rebuked me, boy. They chewed me out. It took me a long time to finally realize that the stereotypes and the garbage that had been preached into my head and the foolishness that I had heard was indeed not factual. But when I came out, one of the phrases that I learned that was part of being part of the LGBT community, people would use the phrase, oh yeah, he's in the life. You ever heard that? You ever heard somebody say, oh, he's in the life? Or do you think she's in the life? Well, what do you mean? Oh, honey, please. If that, if she's not gay, nobody is. If he's not gay, nobody is. In the life meant that you were gay. That meant that, oh, yeah, they're part of the LGBT community. Now, they may be in the closet, but they're in the life. Do you follow what I'm saying? And this term... People begin to use this, oh, he's in the life, or she's in the life, you know? And I thought, well, what in the world's in the life mean? Well, I thought when I came out, I thought if you were gay, that there was only one way to live. You did bars, you did clubs. You know, I never, thank God, I never gave myself over to drinking. 
I never gave myself over to drugs. Those were things that growing up Pentecostal, uh, they were anathema to me, and I didn't want nothing to do with them. Uh, I, I dabbled a little bit with smoking. Uh, I was too fancy for cigarettes, you know, so I dabbled a little bit with smoking the little cigars with tips, you know, tipperillos and what have you. Oh, that just thrilled my grandmother's soul like crazy when she saw me lighten up a tipperillo. And I, I, I dabbled with alcohol to the extent that I would have a drink, but I never, 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 ever uh, tried to use alcohol as a, a self-medication or anything like that. Uh, I knew better than that. Did all kinds of things in the sexual arena that I'm ashamed of, and I will not go into detail. I've told you many times uh, I could tell you things but for many today, the gay lifestyle, as it is called, and I hate that term, involves promiscuity, sex in public places, bathhouses, bookstores, video stores, you know the kind of places, strip clubs, clubbing, drunkenness, drug addiction, rebellion, rejection of God and all things religious. These stereotypes, I can tell you today, are a fiction. There is no such thing as a gay lifestyle. That's why I don't understand the term in the life. What do you mean in the life? He's in the life just because he's gay or just because she's lesbian. What do you mean they're in the life? What life is common to all people who are LGBT. There, there, there's no singular common lifestyle that one can identify that is related to LGBT life. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. But that's the phrase you'll hear. It's a fiction. There's no such thing as a gay lifestyle. Sexual orientation and gender identification have nothing to do with choice. And by no means are they a, quote, lifestyle choice, end quote. But I've got news for you today. Choosing to believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and embracing the life which is found only in Christ is a lifestyle choice. Hallelujah. When you choose to believe and obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you choose to become a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, when you choose to live for the Lord, you do in fact embrace a lifestyle. Now, when I say lifestyle, I'm not talking about rules and regulations as many would identify, quote-unquote, the Christian lifestyle. I know certain so-called holiness churches that will tell you that the Christian lifestyle includes this rule, that rule, this regulation, that regulation. But I'm here today to make it plain and to make it clear that the Christian life as the Apostle Paul refers to it in Galatians chapter 2. He said in verse 20 at the end of our primary text today, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now listen. And the life which I now live. Hallelujah. Once you become a follower of Christ, you live a new life. Amen. You have a new lifestyle. He said, the life which I now live in the flesh, listen, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Got news for you. In the life today? Are you in the life that only Jesus Christ can offer? 
Because if you are in the life, it's not about rules. It's not about regulations. Lady, it doesn't have nothing to do with how long your hair is. It doesn't make a difference one way or the other, how far down your leg your skirt goes. It doesn't matter, mister, whether or not you go to the barber every other week to get your hair trimmed up. The life that I now live, he didn't say I live by the rules that God has set for me. He said I live by the faith. Hallelujah. That should give you some idea of what it is to be in the life that Jesus Christ offers. What is, what is it to be in the life? John chapter 14 verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Christian lifestyle is a lifestyle of the just. It is a lifestyle of the justified. Those who have been justified by faith. Those who have been justified through faith and obedience to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Christian lifestyle today is not marked by standards. It's not marked by rules and regulations and laws and commandments. It is marked by faith. The life that I now live, I live by what? The faith. Hallelujah. Faith as a way of life. Faith as the answer to every challenge. Faith as a response to every trial and every tribulation that we face. In Romans chapter 1 verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from rule to rule. No. From commandment to commandment. No. From standard to standard. No. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Hallelujah! For it is written, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. Are you in the life today? Are you in the faith today? Are you walking a life that is marked by faith? There's a lot of people in church this afternoon who are not in the life. There are a lot of people who are in religion today who are not in the life. Right. There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians today who are not in the life. Honey, you can call yourself Christian. You can call yourself a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ. You can call yourself living for the Lord. You can call yourself walking with the Lord. You can use whatever lingo, whatever language, whatever uh, terms you want to use. But that does not mean that you're in the life. But the Apostle Paul said, but the life I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me oh the life of a believer is a life of faith I'm going to tell you there's so many of us today who are in the church but we're not in the life oh my goodness listen now I'm not done almost but not quite in Galatians chapter 3 Verse 17, the Word of God declares, For therein... Oh, I'm sorry, I just read that to you. Galatians 3.11 is where I'm trying to read. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. For the just shall live by faith, not by standards, not by rules, not by regulations, not by laws, not by commandments. The just shall live, shall live, shall live by faith. If you're in the life, you're living by faith. Am I telling the truth? To be in the life that Jesus Christ has called us to, you've got to be in a lifestyle of faith. 
Oh my goodness, have mercy. <sighs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul have no pleasure in him. In Hebrews 11 and 6, but without, con excuse me, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Mm -hmm. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a punisher of those that do not do his commandments. Oh no, wait a minute. No, that's not what Paul said. Let me let me read it again. I must have I, I must be dyslexic or something and kind of mixed it up. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must follow the rules and believe that God will send you to hell to burn for eternity. <laughs> No, see, I, I'm telling you, Tommy, these words keep jumbling up on the page. Now let the Word of God speak to you today. But without faith it is impossible to please Him, to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. In other words, you first, you can't come to God if you don't believe God exists. So in order to come to God, you must first believe that He is exists and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. My God, Paul, you're not preaching hellfire and brimstone like you're supposed to. You're not preaching against sin like you're supposed to. You're telling people that in order to come to God, you must first acknowledge that God exists and then believe that God will reward you if you seek Him diligently. What's wrong with you, Paul? Your message is off base. What's wrong with you, Pastor Charles? Your message is off base. You're not preaching this the way my Pentecostal pastor preaches this. Uh, no, because I'm preaching the Word of God. I'm not preaching Pentecostal crap. Right. I'm preaching the Word of God. I'm not preaching Baptist garbage. I'm preaching the Word of God. I'm not preaching Presbyterian poop. Yes, I said it. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. The Word of God declares in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The life of faith is marked by works or by actions, listen to me children, which demonstrate that faith. When our actions contradict our faith, <laughs> that means only one thing. Our faith is able. Absent without leave. Our faith is absent. Our faith is not present. When your actions contradict your faith, honey, then that simply means your faith has decided to go on vacation and has left you alone to face your circumstance, to face your trial, to face your situation without it. Amen. There is no such thing as having faith and acting contrary to that faith. It's impossible. Therefore, we have a lot of Christians in the world who are in the church, but they're not in the life. They're not living a lifestyle of faith. They don't live like God's in control. They don't live like they believe the Word of God. How many fundamentalists and evangelicals are out there screaming and hollering today, oh my God, we got to change the world. we got to affect change in this issue. we got to affect change in that issue. Because I don't believe for one minute God will do it without me. I don't believe for one minute God has the ability to do anything about it. Uh, I don't believe that if things go a different way that that's within the will of God well that's stupid you can believe that God will use a wicked evil demonic man 
to do his will. But you can't believe that when things in the world are not going the way that you believe they ought to as a child of God, that God is in it. Mm -hmm. Isn't it funny how they choose to pick and choose how they're going to believe? Yep. Isn't it funny how they pick and choose how they're going to apply things and how they're going to believe things? But then there are those believers today who are in the life. And they live their lives like the just are meant to live their lives. Like the justified are meant to. I live by faith. Hallelujah. I know Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I know my Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I know that my God shall supply every need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I know that the promises of God are yea and amen in Him. Hallelujah to God. Oh, I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to fret. I'm not going to be fearful. I'm not going to be anxious because I live a lifestyle of faith. Honey, I'm not just in the church. I'm in the life. Hallelujah! And Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. He said, but I am come that they might have life and have that life more abundant. Hallelujah! Oh, I want to tell you, Jesus said, peace I give unto you. Glory to God. The word of God said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Woo! When you are walking and living by faith, then whatever's going on around you, let it go on. Because I know according to the word of God, there isn't a thing in the world. If abortion is running rampant in America and there are 10 million abortions a year, guess what? God's in control. God has not lost control. God is not out of his throne simply because things that you believe ought not to be happening are happening. The Bible said in the last days, evil men shall wax worse and worse. Yes. You're pretty stupid if you think that you're supposed to affect things so that things get better and more godly when the word of God tells us plainly the exact opposite of that is going to happen. Right. Therefore, if you're walking by faith and living by faith, and believe in the word of God then when you see these things happening you're saying yep God said it would be so and it is so amen mm -hmm. my Lord have mercy today I don't want to get up here and act like an expert. I'd be a hypocrite to get up here today and tell you, oh, bless God, uh, I walk when I'm preaching and I never falter from it. No, i got news for you. This old preacher, my faith goes AWOL once in a while too. Other day, I about had a nervous breakdown on Tommy. I was just having a fit. Uh, not, not mad at him or anything like that, but this whole situation going on in our nation right now and with our government, and we've got the most corrupt, ungodly, evil, demonic, satanic, deceiving devil that I have ever laid eyes on in my life. And it disgusts me and it troubles me because I know that if things continue in the path that they're going down right now, that the hell that is about to be unleashed in this nation is going to be similar, if not worse, to anything they saw in Hitler's Germany in the 1930s. And I mean, I just kind of blew a gasket. I, my pressure valve had to release and, and my mouth just flapped and I had all kinds of things to say and I just blew because it, it, it built up in me. And I'm going to tell you, I thought about this message and I, I'm saying to myself, oh God, have mercy on my soul, Jesus. This is not how a person that's justified, a person that's walking by faith ought to be acting and reacting to what's going on right now. I should be walking and living by faith knowing that God's in control. Whatever happens, happens. He's going to take care of me. And if I die, I die. I go to heaven. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Either way, I'm going to wind up the winner. So it doesn't really matter. But see, for a little bit there, my behavior, my conduct, my actions did not support or bear testimony to my faith. When our actions contradict our faith, our faith is absent. Period. 
The Word of God said, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Faith without action is dead also. I do what I do. I live what I live because of my faith. I choose not to do other things also because of my faith. I go to church, I tithe, I pray, I give charitably, I show compassion, I support those who are struggling and suffering because of my faith, not my religion, because of my faith. I remember, I'm trying to bring this to a close today, I remember pastoring my first church and a lady in our church came to me, Sue, and she told me, she said, Pastor, I know a single mom. She goes to a, a Assemblies of God church, and they're not real supportive of her, and they don't help her a whole lot. But she has two kids, and uh, one of them's about 11, and the other one's about 5 or so. And she said, this poor woman struggles and struggles. All she lives on is uh, child support from her ex-husband and this and that. And, you know, and she doesn't have any groceries. Is there any way we can help? Her. And I said, yes, Sue, there is. So we went downstairs where I had a little apartment in this building. We were meeting on the third floor, and I had turned an office suite into an apartment. And I loaded up boxes and bags with groceries out of my own cabinets. And I about emptied my cabinets. And I said, here, bring this to her. Give this to her. And Sue looked at me, and she said, Pastor said, you're leaving yourself with nothing. How can you do that? How, how can you give everything that you've gotten away like that? I said, you know, you've got to have something. I said, honey, I have something. I said, you know, that woman may or may not be able to believe God to meet her needs. I said, but I can. Hallelujah. See, I don't know if, if June is able to believe God to meet her needs or not, but I know I can. Hallelujah. I've got something. The life I now live, I live by faith. Hallelujah. Said, I'm not worried about whether I'm going to go hungry. I'm more worried about whether she's going to go hungry. Hello now. Her faith may or may not be where it needs to be so she can trust the Lord to meet every need. So let's just do our part. Let's do what we're supposed to do. I can give away everything I've got. I can give away stuff I've got uh, because I know that God is going to take care of me. Why do I need to worry about it? I can give you a coat like I've done in the past, you know, winter coat to a man who's homeless because God's going to take care of me. I'm not going to freeze to death. I'm not going to die. Amen? Mm -hmm. The life I now live, I live by faith. How can Christ Jesus be my peace and my source of joy if I need to use drugs, alcohol, cigarettes to self-medicate in an effort to achieve what I claim and what the Word of God promises that the Lord alone provides? Why don't I smoke? Do I not smoke because if I smoke, I'll go to hell? No. Do I not drink because if I drink, I'm going to go to hell? No. Do I not use drugs because, uh, it, you know, if I use drugs, I'm going to go to hell? No, that's not at all what motivates me. The life I now live, I don't live by fear. I live by faith. Therefore, everything I do is anchored in and secured by my faith. That is what informs every decision I make. I don't need alcohol to soothe my nerves. I don't need drugs to elevate me to a different place, to get me out of my troubles and out of my worries. I don't need illicit sex so that I don't feel lonely and I don't feel afraid and I don't feel, uh, you know, by myself. I don't need these things because the life that I now live, I live by faith and God has provided to uh, has promised to provide me with faith God has provided to be the source of my joy God has provide has promised to be my strength in my weakness am I telling the truth I don't do those things for what reason because I'm afraid of hell no because the life that I now live I live by faith and faith in Christ informs everything that I do. 
and everything that I don't do. Hallelujah. My question to you this afternoon is, are you in the life or are you just in the church?